Hey, this is Wally, and you're listening to the Young Justice Files on the Whelmed podcast, or whatever. Whelmed? Dick, did you make him say that? Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Nick Tice, D-3-3. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Nick Tice. Nick is the co-host of the Unapologetic Geek Out podcast, where he and his co-hosts discuss geek conventions and the latest geek news, interview content creators, review films for their series Netflix and Kill, and more. In fact, they invited me on the show recently for a deep dive into Young Justice, which you can check out right now. Uh, this time, I'm going to attempt to let Nick talk at some point uh, during the interview, which I did not let him do last time. <laughs> Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Rich, thank you so much for inviting me on and letting me talk. That is very, <laughs> you know, accommodating of you. What a great, what a great host. It's only fair. It's only fair. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that uh, out of the way, let's dive in. So, uh, Nick, I I touched on a couple things in the intro, but tell us more about you. Who are you? What do you do? Oh, who am I in, like, an existential sense? Yeah, basically. Well, okay, well, it's all started in 1990, <laughs> in May, when I was born, and, you know, <laughs> you want to skip all the past of that. Uh, Maybe. I uh, am a geek, an unapologetic one, and I love podcasts, and I wanted to get involved in the podcast scene. I also want to get involved in more conventions. Back about three years, I went to my first convention, and I want. I thought, this is my place, this is my mecca, this is my people. And I wanted to get more yeah. involved with that. So we uh, made up a podcast and started running panels at uh, conventions for the podcast. And we do a lot of convention work and coverage. And we're starting to get into more of that, even starting up to uh, possibly opening up vendor booths for the podcast at certain conventions. So if you're any at any conventions in the Midwest uh, anytime this year, you might want to look us up because we might be there with you. So are these these conventions are they are they pop culture conventions? Are they geek con- like uh, gaming conventions? Are they comic conventions? What do you guys What do you guys focus on? Oh, we we cover everything. We do anime conventions. We were just mm. doing. We're going to be doing Katsudakon this year. That's in our home hometown of Green Bay. That's for sure. Okay. Uh, as well as Anime Milwaukee coming up this month. Uh, if you guys are in the Milwaukee area at all. Or we could, we do stuff like GeekCon, which is a general geek convention. We do the smaller Comic Cons around, and the we don't really do we don't have a chance to get up to the big stuff like Salt Lake City or you know San Diego. We can't really afford to do that right now, so sure. that's sort of out of our wheelhouse. But we do do we do, we like to keep it general. We were we're open to anything and everything geek related. Are you guys going to be? Do you guys go to Gen Con? Because that's kind of around your general space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're uh, looking to do that one this year. It's it's hard to say because we go to conventions based off of what what, uh, what we get in for vendors and panels mm-hmm. that we run. Right. And we don't actually get, sometimes we don't get a notice of when our panels are approved until like a month out. So oh, wow. it's kind of hard to, you know, uh, give a for sure on everything. We usually keep people updated on the on the site when we get uh, approved and stuff. But Katsunicon is a for sure because it's so it's it's on our backyard in Green Bay. So we we go no matter what panels are, you know, uh, accepted or not. So you're so you're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of animation then. Like from oh, yeah. all, all different kinds of stuff. That's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I love cartoons ever since I was a kid, Saturday mornings with my breakfast cereal. <laughs> I had my Fruit Loops. And nice. I I had my, you know, Gargoyles and Batman the Animated Series. And the, if the 90s were good for anything, it was for animation. So Yeah, there was some good stuff going on then. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you should check out uh, the Gameable Saturday Morning Podcast, uh, where they uh, analyze breakfast cereal and animated series. Uh, we've had the host Chris on the show a couple times. It's pretty amazing. 
wow, I <laughs> that sounds right up my alley. I would, I, I would right? definitely exactly. Do that. He's like, I don't know. I thought we thought maybe animation and gaming there might be like a Venn diagram crossover. <laughs> I'm like, oh yes, <laughs> yes please. Also breakfast cereal. <laughs> anyway, enough about Chris. So when did you first see Young Justice? Did you see it on the original run? Did you watch it on DVD, Netflix? What's the story there? I saw it on the original run, uh, even though I didn't have Cartoon Network at the time. I uh, uh, I uh, found it through other means, let's say. And yeah, I actually sure. watched the first episode out of spite because my favorite show uh, before that was Teen Titans. I actually really liked the previous Teen Titans show. Mm-hmm. A lot. And it was so crushing to me that it got dropped uh, a season before it would have wrapped up. It left a lot of story stuff hanging with the last episode. Mm. And it, it was going to have each season would focus on each one of the characters. There was five, you know, of the Teen Titans and there was only four seasons. So Starfire got uh, got the shaft for that final season because they just, uh, I guess, ran out of audience or interest or, or whatnot. Yeah. But yeah, I watched it. I watched it uh, when I was back working at a daycare, and I got huh. the. I had the. Uh, I had it downloaded, and I actually watched it with a bunch of kids the first time I watched it. I watched the first two episodes uh, oh, nice. with a bunch of, let's say, like I was it like five to uh, seven year olds, and they loved it. So that was how I ended up watching it, and it was a really cool experience. That's really cool. Sharing it right off the bat, I love it. So what's your, I mean, why did, what drew you to that? Was it just the Titans TV show that kind of drew, drew you into this? Or what was your history with comics in the, before that? Did you know these characters before the Titans show? Oh, sure. Well, that's the, the reason I watched this show was because I'm like, well, I got to see what they replaced my favorite show with, especially when I heard Aqualad <laughs> was going to be the, the leader. I'm like, what? Aqualad? Ugh. Well, I guess I'm going to watch this train wreck. <laughs> but before that, what got me into the Teen Titans show was that I was into comics when uh, I was a kid, uh, but I was I couldn't get to the comic book shops, so I was stuck with whatever was at the gas station or sure. uh, what was what was you know in the bookstores and that you know that kind of like magazine the rack. magazine racks yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I would, I found uh, I you know when you only afford like one comic, like what do you do? You get the comic book for, let's say, uh, the as many superheroes as you can get. <laughs> right. And when you're a kid, you get the comic book with as many kid superheroes as you can get. I, and so that led me to Teen Titans. Perfect sense to me. Perfect sense. I figured that was the most bang for my buck. And I knew who Robin was. I didn't know who any of these other people were, but I knew who Robin was. Right. So I grabbed uh, some early 90s issues of Teen Titans was my, was my jam. That was my thing. It was very confusing because they crossed over. I had no idea what was going on in any of the other DC universe at all. Right. So around Infinite Crisis, I got super oh, confused. Yikes. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, they but they weren't going to get my money. No, I was just going to stick with uh, Teen Titans. <laughs> right. Right. But that was it then pretty much. Just just Titans. So you, you've been a Titans focused uh, superhero fan. Uh, yeah, I've it's expanded out once I, you know, uh, became an adult and had uh, got a disposable income. I got to catch up <laughs> right. and I, I became an avid DC reader up until Blackest Night. And then I f- kind of fell off and I was into Marvel up until uh, the better part of Civil War. And then I dropped off. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So like the big events kind of tired me out. And then I switched to Image for a while. I w- read some Saga uh, invincible for some, my superhero fix. And then I, <laughs> I know I kind of dropped off of physical comics and I started reading digital stuff. And now I'm reading right. that in between. And now I actually doing the podcast. I'm, I'm very behind on my comic reading because I'm, mm-hmm. uh, doing so much more content for the podcast. Yeah. I mean, you guys cover, you guys cover a lot, like you guys cover a lot of everything. So it's, it's one of those things where you've got the breadth, but sometimes the, the depth takes the, takes the toll, right? Oh yeah. I consider myself a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Uh, right. and <laughs> that's for, for me, it's, it's good because I don't get, uh, I actually, uh, I'm jealous of when I listen to you guys of how much you know about young justice, how wealth how well thought out your points are. But I, I, then I, uh, when I see other people get super into one thing and I see like, 
you know, toxic fandoms for stuff, like even stuff that I love, like Steven Universe or Rick and Morty. I'm like, yeah. well, maybe it's good that I'm not so into just one thing. Yeah, and I'm, no, I hear I'm you. into, you know, I, I diversify. I like to I like to keep, you know, I like to keep my options open. No, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, and by the way, the uh, the jack of all trades, master of none is trademarked by our producer. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. you know, D- DM Jote Moniac, which is jack of all trades, master of none. Yak. Nice. <laughs> t- there you go, tell you what, he can fight me. He can fight me for it. Uh, he's got a powerful Whoa. beard, man. A powerful beard. You don't want to. You don't want to mess with the beard. Like all good jacks, they all That's have right. good beards. <laughs> exactly. So when you and I were talking off mic from the other show, uh, from your show, when I was guesting on there, we were talking about a few things. We talked a little bit about your Teen Titans um, uh, enthusiasm. Uh, mm-hmm. from the animated series. But the other thing that you mentioned that was really interesting to me was you said that one of the things that, that caught you about the show, especially in season two, was the use of the kind of the political intrigue, that political backdrop and maneuvering that was working its way through the show, even from season one as well, because it's kind of, if you consider, even if it's the superheroes versus the supervillains in the first season, there's still a lot of this political maneuvering, right? So you've got you've got Lex, you know, dealing with North and South Eurasia and working with Raish and all this kind of stuff. In the second season, it gets even heavier because you're dealing with actual politicians and and government uh, agencies and things like that. But is that something that interests you in other stories? And it jumped out at you for this? Like, what what what's the story behind your interest in the political backdrop? I find uh, the political ba- backdrop in Young Justice to be very interesting for a couple reasons. One being that th- it's a very different take on superheroes involved in their own world space. It became very popular in like what I was just talking about before, like events like, say, Civil War or, uh, you know, even in the most recent film, Batman versus Superman, there's a lot of what if superhumans existed, how would the world treat them like how would how would our governments uh you know react to them how would we you know process the idea of super people living amongst us it became it's become a very popular thing to do nowadays Mm -hmm. so young justice most of the time they approach it from it's a new thing and we have to deal with it like the batman versus superman has a whole question of if it should if there is a superman should there be a superman like that's the main ethos of that story or should be, I don't know, for most of the time it's like two and a half hours of nonsense, but uh, I think that's what it's trying to get across. <laughs> right. uh, Civil War is very much about, hey, you guys, I know, I know you guys are wanting to do good, but we can't have a dedicated force just going out and, you know, doing missions uh, uh, for their own sake. Yeah. Which always struck me very interesting in, in that movie in Civil War because I'm like, huh, that's the Justice League. That's basically what they do. And Civil War is basically kind of uh, the treatise of uh, what's the what's a superhero team to do when they are looked upon as their as an extension of their government, right? Because they're very much an American team in that one, and the Justice League are not really looked like at, on like that, which I always thought was interesting. Well, what's interesting to what's interesting, what is interesting to me is that. I don't know when they made the switch exactly, but it didn't used to just be called Justice League. It used to be called Justice League of Justice America. League International. Yeah, it was and then Justice, Justice League of America. League International, right. And, so yeah. Justice League International was actually a separate team that was not American based. And for a, a while now, it's just been the Justice League, which I think is perfectly, which is appropriate and great. But I mean, it tells you like, yeah, that's where it's coming from. And they dealt with it in the Justice League animated series a little bit. And even early in Young Justice, Bruce makes a comment about how he's sending the team to Bialya because they don't have a UN sanction for the League to go there, which is kind of a weird, messed up thing when you think about it. Well, you were right. They first touched upon this in the Justice League uh, Unlimited cartoon Mm -hmm. where they have a whole satellite up in space. Uh, The government knows about that. They pretty much treat the... The Justice League, and we don't really see the, you know, the government per se. We see uh, the army and we see Waller, who is kind of like the CIA, you know, black ops yeah. end of the government. So we only see kind of the worst of the worst. God, she's so she's so good in that, actually. 
And well, that's the thing. Like they knew that there was a they knew that the, the government knew that there was a watchtower. What they didn't know was that the watchtower could be weaponized. And in that Justice League animated series, there was an alien incursion and they like blew out their generators to generate this giant laser blast. And the government's like, wait, the what? <laughs> like, you yeah. guys have this massive, devastating weapon you can use? It, it generates enough power like the it's like an isolated nuclear blast. And rewatching that as an adult, I was kind of like, ooh, I don't mean to be on uh, General Eiling's side here because he's kind of yeah. a jerk. But but uh, I don't know, guys, this this seems iffy to me. I, I don't, I'm, it, I'm exactly. Not, I'm not down with this. <laughs> and, and especially when someone takes oh, takes it over and fires at a city. Right. Or fires at a Cadmus facility. And, you know, when you know, Batman confronts Waller, you know, he's talking to her about it. And she's like, well, well, why do you think that it was Luther? And Batman's like, because there's only four people on the planet smart enough to hack into our systems. And three of them were already on the watchtower. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and then when you, when you uh, get it like that, like what well, superhero logic, it's like, yeah, well, of course that would have happened. And what I find interesting about young justice is that it takes the tact of, not only showing actual politicians in this show, but actually they don't know about the watchtower at all. Like they don't even, they don't even know about that. And yeah, straight up in the first, in the first uh, season, Batman sends a bunch of child soldiers to on a black ops missions. They don't have uh, sanctions to fight yep. in, uh, in reality. And I'm like, Ooh, that's uh that is morally a little dicey there. But when you think about, if you think about the Justice League, which I think Young Justice, this is what they're trying to do. The Justice League are their almost their own nation, which is why mm -hmm. I think that they work with the United Nations in the way that they do. They treat they treat the Justice League like they are their own entity that they uh, get aid from and get and get uh, you know and you know have their own. They have their own liaison. They they treat them almost like their their own country, mm -hmm. and. When you have your own country, you do have a, you know, you have your PR team, you have your ambassadors, and you have your, you know, government team that takes care of black ops missions for you. It's, you know, the team is the CIA of the uh, mm -hmm. Justice League. Mm -hmm. it, they take on the missions that the League can't be seen doing. And that is a very interesting, you know aspect to the whole show like well i mean it's the premise of the show but i i like the whole political bent on it and i didn't realize how much they were going to do with it up until season two where they the reach start to use all that against them yep when they come down and launch their own pr campaign which is a great conflict for season two because it's totally different than the normal conflict of you know say espionage and you know straight up fights between supervillains it's very interesting to see the Justice League in a full-out PR war against an alien race mm -hmm. and losing at yeah. every turn. Because the Reach are there are benevolent saviors, and the Justice League are starting to be seen as loose cannons and whether or not they can be trusted. And half the team is missing. Like, where are they? What are they doing? Right. Uh, so it's kind of it's interesting to see the general public how they would react to that. Yeah. Uh, the only other ex uh, only other time I've seen that was you know in uh, Marvel Comics did something similar when they had Norman Osborn be the head of Shield uh, for a while and where he renamed it to Hammer uh, during the Dark Reign story arc, which I never bought there because it would have to require everyone have a collective amnesia because Nor they'd have to forget <laughs> right. Norman Osborn is convicted murderer. Right. Uh. So. Yeah, I. But then again, in our current political climate, I'm like, oh, well, maybe I, you know, maybe it's not so unbelievable that people would elect a Green Goblin to lead them. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Like in the in the comics, particularly in DC comics, of course, there was a time in which Lex was running running for and I think won the presidency. And um, and in Young Justice, because it's such a clean slate of the DC universe, this is their own take on the DC universe that they do so brilliantly while keeping the heart of these characters alive, instead of having Lex be uh, running for president of the United States, he, they're, they set him up all the way through season one and season two to become the new head of the United Nations, which is actually the direct liaison with the Justice League, right? So, like, it's, 
it's interesting that they do their own little take, but within the con within the context of the universe that they themselves have created, and and though all the superheroes are like, yeah, Lex Luthor, we know what he's doing behind the scenes. He hasn't been arrested for anything. He's still a businessman. Like he, he like he has the respect. He hasn't been arrested. You know, like there's nothing. There's there is no uh, public amnesia that's required in Young Justice, which is really interesting. Yeah, uh, because in the Justice League Unlimited show where he was going to make his run for politics, I was like, wait a minute aren't you a convicted felon? Like <laughs> I did, I, I never quite got that, but then even, in, even at the end of Ju- young uh, justice league unlimited, they did the whole, you know, president, do you, do you know how much power I'd have to give up to be president? Right, exactly. When the question is, the question is uh, in his office. That was such a great scene. No, and it's great. It totally makes sense too. Cause it's like, no, no, the, one of the Koch brothers wouldn't become president. Why bother? They just <laughs> right. buy one. It doesn't, right. it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh yeah, that, that totally makes way more sense, which is what the, uh, the light do in season one is that they're building up political clout and it's in season one, politics and governments are things the league has to work around. Yeah. And the, it's something that the uh, the supervillains actually work with. They actually, you know, they set it up to where uh, Hugo Strange is ends up being in charge of Bell Rev, and that works to put a revolving door on the uh, on uh, the prison in which they get sent to if they get caught by the Justice League. Right. It's a way of uh, of control uh, yet again, and. It becomes even worse uh, in season two, where just the even the you know the 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 biggest faces of the league, like the most PR friendly faces of the league, Superman, Wonder Woman, uh, you know they they Captain all Adam. Uh, yeah Captain yeah Captain Adam all the or no even Cap- Captain Adam's the only one left who is like the good American all American boy that's left to do the PR stuff right which. Which is like, okay, well, he's, you know, he's probably good. Uh, you know, he's he's got the whole soldier thing. People probably like him. Right. But he's got a lot to deal with oh where he's, during meetings, he's getting, <laughs> he's getting like, wait, what situation at the hall? <laughs> and then the, the Reach so Ambassador funny. coming out of nowhere, sidling him, like, <laughs> just yeah. a mood him. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Where, where did you not know about not, this? Is that not public, public knowledge? Do you yeah. get, did not everyone know about the giant satellite in space? We passed right by it. It was, you know, like we had right. to, we put on our turn signal and it was right there. I just right. thought everyone knew about it. Right. right. My bad. The reach the reach could really t- teach a class on passive aggressive. <laughs> right, exactly. Um what's interesting too is how they set that up, right? Cuz so in Justice League Unlimited it's it the, the the Justice League Watchtower has always been kind of a odd duck that you have to kind of hand wave with comic logic right okay so it's financed by bruce okay was Mm -hmm. it directly financed by bruce i mean somebody had to build this thing like they had to like build the parts and bring it together and put it up there like if you're talking about like batarangs and a and a batmobile okay but a a giant high-tech satellite in space like that's not going to get tracked to bruce that's interesting but in young justice uh it wasn't directly said in the series but Brandon Vietti uh, wrote an article where he was talking about where the tower came from, which is yeah, w- and it's actually hinted at in the on the floor. It's right, like there's uh, symbols on the floor in the Green Lantern symbol. Right, exactly. So the 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 watchtower is actually in a uh, Green Lantern way station. Yeah, it's it was a Green Lantern. It was a what's decommissioned. It's a dismantled. That's not the word. Yeah. Decommissioned uh, Green Lantern outposts that uh, Hal and John uh, dragged into orbit uh, by the permission of the Guardians and used that as the base. So they didn't have to build anything and they didn't have to like try and hide a bunch of stuff in line items in a board meeting, right? You know, like it, it's just there. And, and it's got this, it's got the Zeta Beam technology. It's got all the stuff that the Guardians would possibly put there. Also, it's nice. It's got like a garden, and it's got all kinds of crazy stuff in it. Like it's, uh, oh, sure. it's pretty cool. Yeah. And you know what I, I love about that is that the the it explains why the watchtower is there. It gets rid of the whole, you know, uh, uh, you know, who set up the satellite. Like what, like how many people did Batman have to pay off as a right. as they worked on the satellite, sort of thing, or kill. Right. But even then, it's uh, there's even more political stuff with the. The Green Lanterns, like the, there's a whole reason the Green Lanterns don't just show up during oh, right. the alien invasion. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. 
because now there's now in season two we deal with intergalactic politics where the league has been uh made enemies uh, enemies of uh, the galactic federation or whatever it is right and the uh, Green Lantern Corps can't go to a planet that's invited the Reach already. They're not allowed. That's not their jurisdiction anymore. Right. And you know what? Now that I have you, you can you explain this to me? Why, like, it, it seems as though, you know, there's supposed to be one Green Lantern per sector, but our sector gets three or four of them. Yeah, like, they, they <laughs> kind of, they kind of read, well, yes. And I know it's so because that's... they keep killing like they killed Hal Jordan and then like he and then Kyle Rayner became the new lantern and then there was uh John Stewart for a while and then uh not to even mention Alan Scott or Guy Gardner right I was I just imagine is so I get how they all become Green Lanterns but why do they all stay here right. like, shouldn't they all be off on their own other sector then as soon as they be or is it just recognized that Earth is in the sector that's basically the Detroit of the galaxy <laughs> like it's just the most heavily uh <laughs> just Cr- crazy chaos ridden sector yeah it uh it gets a little com- it gets a little complicated yes but we we actually uh we haven't aired it yet but we've actually interviewed uh, i sat down with chris Sneezak from misdirected mark podcast and talked to in depth about the green lantern Corps and its history um and the the short answer is they've retconned that to be that there can be potentially multiple lanterns per sector and the sectors are enormous like these aren't just like so the sector of uh, two eight one four where where John and Hal and everybody is isn't just like the soul system. Uh, the sector is huge. I mean, they're supposed to be covering the entirety of the Milky Way galaxy. So and there's only like ten thousand lanterns or something like that. I don't know, hundred thousand. But I mean, even if it's a hundred, they're they're just, you know what I mean. It's it's an entire mm-hmm. galaxy. So these sectors are huge. But yeah, first it was Hal, and then it was John Stewart, and then it was Guy, and then it was Kyle. And Alan Scott's a whole different ball of wax because Alan Scott is his ring is actually magical. It's not the original lantern. So the the retcon story of that is that the lan- that a wizard from the past saw a lantern core member land on Earth, saw what was happening with the lantern and everything, recreated this uh, as a as a magical artifact that was being handed down, and that's how Alan Scott got a hold of it. So he's yeah, not that's why his is still member. weak to wood. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's something about what, yeah. We go into it with Chris. Go back and listen to that. Well, as far, when this airs, you can go back and listen to it, but we haven't aired it yet for you. So yeah. Gotta love comics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really? Comic continuity. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I, I agree with you, actually. And, and, and in season three, I mean, basically we're being promised even more of the same, right? Because it's, it's this, you know, galaxy-wide uh, weapons, you know, arms race, for the human metagenes is all we really know, right? So that means mm-hmm. we're going to be getting even more inter- intergalactic politics. Yeah, I you know the, if there's one thing I, I really wish that I could see more of in the in the show because I, I always love how they deal with certain things like the the Krolatean, uh, uh, imp- like imposters in the first couple episodes, especially in the first episode where Lobo takes out the uh, <laughs> Ambassador Singh yeah. and. And it turns out, oh, Ambassador Singh had a, it was a Krolatean and a, uh, and a robot body. And I'm just like, what happens to like that country the next day when their ambassador right. turns out to be an alien in a robot body? Right. Like, how right. does that work? Like, did do, do, like, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, all, all foreign relations are suspended because it turns out our ambassador was an alien in a robot body. Right. Uh, that's that's actually under rule rule three here. He was. It's different from the shapeshifter one that we have. Right. The protocol right. subsection so, A versus subsection B. <laughs> you'd have to figure that with stuff like this, you they'd have to have a system of like checking one's identity. Like you know, I would do that even before any vote would ever come to pass on like a Senate meeting or anything like that. Of just like, hey, prove that you're not a shapeshifter, like and or a Martian or a robot yeah. or a duplicate or an evil clone and that's a and that's a thing like in the comics um john is john jones is the last martian right or at least he thinks he is until they find some other stuff which is so fascinating in this series because he's not the last martian no their civilization is still fully active and alive which means you basically have super powerful mind controlling invisibility mastering shape-changing kryptonians like the next planet over 
like you know like just down the they way they just didn't have that darn heat weakness of like a, of being so afraid of fire that i think they could really conquer the earth and no pro with no problem whatsoever yeah and I, I talk about that a little bit in the miss martian uh secret origins episode where one of the retconned explanations of why they have this pyrophobia is actually because the guardians implanted that in the entire race the entire species because if they didn't they would basically just take over everything because back in mm -hmm. the day in the comics i mean they they tone certain things down now and balance him out a little more but martian manhunter was you know, he was Superman. He was Superman with all the extra powers in addition to everything else. He had the heat vision, even though there was a heavy pyrophobia. They had like everything. It was nuts. And so they kind of toned all that down a little bit and, and made it a little bit more niche protection, niche protection um, with, the, with the characters. But yeah, I don't know. So the fact that they're still alive there, I mean, I just keep thinking like, oh my God, are they going to genocide the whole, ray, <laughs> whole, whole Martian race at some point or... It's it's a little darker to do it in in timeline. It's a little it's a little less to deal with in the Justice League show previously, where yeah. they just like uh, by the time we find the White Martians, the Green Martians have been wiped out, and we just get a backstory with 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 Jean. Right, exactly. And it would it would be a little darker to do it mid uh, mid show, and that's where they're actually exactly. And that's what I'm thinking, like. Wow, are they going to go there? It raises a are lot of questions, though. Like, are we in contact with them? Because we, you know, we're shooting up the the satellite to be in more constant contact with them. Mm -hmm. I'd figure like we're already taking in like superheroes from there. Like, how is there only two Martians on on Earth? Like, it's uh, right. in a, as as far as galactic uh, visitors, it's like right next door. Like, <laughs> right? Uh, do they, like do we exchange goods or technology? Like, what? Like, what? crazy you know things could we be doing uh with the martians as like yeah you know neighboring a neighboring planet well theoretically miss martian stowed on john's ship when he came to earth we don't know what originally had what what happened with john's origin in in young justice uh, that i'm aware of in the original origin it was very similar to like the adam strange origin where he was accidentally transported to earth um, by this guy doing experiments, and then he was trapped here and he couldn't get back. But if he's got a spaceship, and Miss Martian's got a Martian bioship that can go into space, and I'm assuming can can reach Mars, does she go back? Like, John can go back and forth, so does he go back? And if so, why aren't we... That means they have the technology to have the ships to be able to do that. Why is this satellite now a thing that needs to be done? I, I have so many questions. So many questions. Yeah, does he? I I mean, he, I guess he might have a weekend house. Like he he summers <laughs> in uh, in Mars, right? This, Earth, the Watchtower is his is his winter is his winter home, right? Oh, well, and then of course you have the Zeta technology too, and and theoretically you could say like, well, the Zeta Zeta beam tech only worked on Earth until we figured out this whole thing with Ran. But now that the whole thing with Ran is established, there's really no reason why we can't figure out how to just slap a zeta tube on mars and now we have open relations unless they nuke the place unless they destroy the civilization somehow like maybe there is mm -hmm. a white martian uprising and that can become really interesting politics uh interesting and dramatic and probably heartbreaking politics if you know the white martians finally do just rise up against the the green and and apparently red i've learned are also there mm-hmm well, see, that's always what confuses me about the comics is like, and even in the shows, as long as they're not too long of running, because uh, in Young Justice, like most of the general public doesn't know about all this crazy happenstance that's going on. But if they if we start to, like, you know, communicate more with the Martians and let's say in the comics where there's been years and years of continuity of just crazy, you know, t teleporting aliens, alien visitors, tech you know, bouncing back and forth. And yet, still, the general populace still drives around in diesel engines and Correct. uses, which I'm sure must be archaic cell phone technology to to aliens. Like, how are we not teleporting? How How is the technology not integrated into regular society and regular comics? Which I know that the easy answer is that the writers don't want to write a whole new world in which uh, things have been mm -hmm. uh, altered because uh, Steve Jobs got beat out by Martian technology at one point. Right, <laughs> right, right. 
But that's an that's an interesting point. I mean, there are other there are other comics who address that in some ways. I think Astro City uh, it, it deals with that in some cases. There's a there's a great miniseries called Top Ten, which is a police precinct in a city that's basically fill, filled with people who have superpowers. So mm-hmm. even the police precinct people are all like one of the police sergeants is a is an uplifted super genius intelligent doberman who what? who walks around who who curls himself up in this robot and walks around like it's it's crazy but like the whole <laughs> there's even a scene <laughs> oh god it's so funny there's this there's this one just throwaway scene where an exterminator gets called but he's called the exterminator like he's a superhero and he shows up in an apartment complex that's had an infestation, but it's an infestation of super mice. And they're having a, a, a gigantic cosmic crossover with the super cats that also exist in that world. And that just the one screen, like screenshot, the one panel of like a Galactus like cat uh, fighting like what looks like a, a, a like Reed Richards Fantastic Four mouse with an ultimate nullifier device. It's there's and it's chocked full of these characters. It's so funny. But in that they took it to the extreme in the other way, in that there's so much so many superpowers, right? And so many different things that it affects it affects everything around them. And finding that middle ground, you have to look at it and say, like, all right, well how far do we want to take this before the place that our watchers are watching is now uh, something they can't relate to in any way, Mm -hmm. right? The difference between Metropolis and Batman and and Gotham in the Batman and Superman animated series, you know, Metropolis was a high-tech future with lasers and that kind of stuff. But Gotham in the same, you know, Earth looked like the 1930s with Tommy (laughs) guns, you know? So, I mean... I, it's a it's a question when you're when you're writing or creating something. How far do you want to go, and how much verisimilitude do you want to have to to the making sure you don't isolate your readers too far? Yeah, it I guess it's easier in shows that are all about the superhero aesthetic. Like normally, like uh, when I read Invincible, like a comic where superheroes are so prevalent, they're they have government, uh, you know, uh, grants to super teams. And like they prisons hire them out to uh, catch people as they escape. Uh, My Hero Academia is an anime that I just recently got caught up on, which deals with superheroes. And that one is is very much like the manga creators must have uh, watched a lot of Western superheroes because they basically their economy and their television, their entertainment all revolve around superheroes who, which in 20 years ago, 90% of the population got superpowers. Like (laughs) 90% of people on the, on the planet have what they call quirks, which are their superheroes. And they're all like nuts. Like you, people can grow giant. So they get all of varying degrees, but like, can you imagine a whole planet where most, if not all the people were super people? Yeah. Like that's, that's crazy. Like you do, have, you, and it would change up your entire society. Like that's why that society is so radically different with uh, clothing lines made specifically for eight armed people. Right. Like there's a, <laughs> there's mannequins that have like multiple arms and people who specialize in making outfits for multiple appendaged uh, super people. Yeah. <laughs> like it's crazy, and I, I I love that amount of detail. And Young Justice always wants to seem to be very much in the real world, which. Uh, uh, with its regu- regular uh, civilian life, and then uh, its you know fantastical stuff will seem that much more fantastical uh, yeah. in contrast. Like that's where it wants to sit. So you know, hopefully, it, if th- that's that's always a thing that I'm ready to accept. I mean, I read comics; it's not like a huge deal, but it's always one thing that always sticks in my mind. Like, wouldn't technology be crazy changing like at a super fast pace, especially if we're jumping five years at a time? Yeah. Well, I think I th- I think that's a really good point. Like the five year jump between the first season and the second season. Yes, the Justice League has been around. Yes, there's been some super powered characters. But once you start introducing characters like Steel or Iron Man or these characters, uh, Reed Richards, like you're, you're introducing these characters that or, or even a Star Labs who's taking alien technology and breaking it down. You're not telling me that they're not funding themselves by creating a high-tech microwave or whatever and making money off of that patent. 
well, how much is Wayne Tech making off of recovered alien technology that they're reintroducing into hospital hospitalization tech or something? Right, right. Like he's not using all of that stuff for batarangs. No, exactly. And I, I think I think the first season it's it's reasonable enough to assume yes, there's been some superheroes, but not a lot of you know alien invasions enough. Now we're talking about like okay, now we're going to be getting into some. We've already had the Reach have showed up, so that's going to affect some stuff, right? There's, uh, you know, you, you've got direct contact for, for fortunate or unfortunate between New Genesis and Apocalypse and Earth, you know, importing technology. So some of that stuff's going to get broken down. And I trust the writers enough to, to think about these things and look forward to those things that I wouldn't trust other writers to do. But I was going to say that I, if you're creating a world like this, the other direction you can go is what, where they went in uh, the miniseries Rising Stars, which was brilliant, in that... There was this uh, the big bright light in the sky one night that nobody could explain until they found out that uh, all of the children that were in this like Midwest area that were in utero at the time that the light went off all were born with superpowers. And there's like 207, like some random number. And only those people have superpowers that they were born with. And the the series is based on the idea that Someone has figured out how to kill them and is slowly murdering them one at a time. Some of them become superheroes, some of them become supervillains, but they all grew up together because they were collected and brought into a government training facility when they were younger to learn what their powers are and what was happening. So um, cool. it was, it's a great story, but because of that, yes, the, uh, they all have powers, but they, aren't div- they didn't have powers that were inventing new necessarily technologies. Right, mm-hmm. like a, like your like your Tony Starks and your Wayne Tex and that kind of stuff, which should re and Lex Luthor, who should be really affecting the economy in some way. Well, you know what I loved about the even the Marvel universe, they did this just a little bit with their short. You ever seen the short uh, Item Forty Seven? No. Where it's it's off of the Avengers DVD set where it's a little short that they they used to run these little shorts with their yeah. shows and stuff like uh it's where Agent Coulson got to you know show up firsthand and and whoop a little butt oh is it the one where he goes to the convenience store yes that one and then the the one after that though and the the one that played before the Avengers has two thieves that bank robbers that uh decide to grab up some Shatari weaponry. And start to rob banks with it, right. and they figure out how to make it work, right? Because no one else has been able to make it work, so they send a shield agent after him, which is you'll recognize him as in uh, uh, in Winter Soldier. He becomes he he's a Hydra agent. He's a sleeper Hydra agent. Oh, gotcha. So that made me think that these two probably were thieves that he hired because he at the end of the short he grabs them up and hires them to be part of the part of the shield team. It's like, hey, these guys figured out how to make Chitari weaponry work. Let's put them to, let's put them to use and make some shield weapons out of this uh, Chitari tech. And I'm like, that that is a cool that now that is cool fallout from stuff. And they did the same thing in Homecoming. Exactly, in Spider-Man Homecoming. Same thing. With, yeah, with Vulture is now because now there's a black market for alien tech that they've been tinkering tinkering around with right. which man i love that they they added it added in the tinkerer in there yeah <laughs> makes it super easy for a bunch of people to get nonsense weapons right in the new in the re, in the rest of the movies because like where do you get that weapon tinkerer got it yeah 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 no i love it i love it as well and and to find out i mean because so i mean even so right after the chitari invasion Tony Stark clearly and damage control took over that technology. Well, it mm-hmm. had been eight years before homecoming happened. So what's Tony been doing with this technology? I mean, he hasn't been making weapons. That's for sure. Yeah, it, and most of the true. Chitauri weapon stuff, like it's all weapons tech. Right. Like the, the aliens brought down, you know, they didn't bring down med kits or, or, you know, right. like maybe some energy cells they might be able to use, but most of that stuff would be weapons technology and that's not tony's bag anymore right and see that's a really good point again for creating your own type of a superhero world there is what is the technology who has access to it and what is their agenda or or lack of agenda therein to be able to control it which i think makes perfect sense my theory is that tony basically suppressed almost all of that tech and he's only he's doing it very slowly if at all to developing that tech cuz he's cuz one of his other things in in iron man 3 is that he's very you know post traumatic stress from the alien he he views the aliens as a big threat so i think he's very scared of that technology and that's a that's a great twist on it too 
I, I was thinking, so that's why we don't see any of that weaponry in like, say, Shield's hands or like some of the uh, like some of the other, uh, you know, like law enforcement or anything like that. But now criminals have it because they were the only ones to run in there and, and grab up some stuff before Tony got his mitts on it. Right. right. So that's why we have a whole, you know, villains with a bunch of crazy weapons now. Right. And so at the end of so at the end of season two of Young Justice, pull it back to, to Young Justice for a minute. I mean, there's Ch- there, not Chitari. There's the uh, the reach technology is. I wouldn't say it's all over the place, but it's going to be in a lot of places. I mean, the War World took out a lot of their their fleet, which means there's stuff floating around in orbit that needs to be either cleaned up or collected. And then, I mean, even ignoring all of that, you also have 22 of those, you know, Beetle Tech drones that they had that they destroyed. So Star Labs is going to get a hold of that as well. Not to mention, there's still apocalyptic technology that hadn't been addressed in the from the first season that was still on Earth as well. And I'm sure Star Labs has gotten a hold of that and, and the, the League as well. And I'm assuming the light. Yeah, I, I th- even in, in, yeah, at the very end of the episode, the, the light are already trying to use Reach, the, the, the drink that they were using, you know, the Reach for a Reach. Yeah. Like that... That reach drink, they're already trying to use it to domesticate some of the populace like their original plan was, which, wow, what a long term plan for the reach when you think about it is using a uh, a drink, a popularized soft drink to, you know, placate the masses, not only on a not on a direct level, but generations like it's going to mess with your g- genetics so that your kids will be more docile and more prone to uh, create superhumans. Right. So by and, and generation so, by generation, you'd become more subservient as a race. Right. And when you're looking at, I mean, two cornerstone characters of the light, Rachel Ghoul, who theoretically is, you know, next to a mortal, and Vandal Savage, who is immortal. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, in, I don't know the brain. I don't know if he's going to get, you know, uh, a, 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 I think a, as long as he gets his brain juice, right. like as well, long as there's juice in there. Well, the brain wears out just like the body does, speaking medically speaking. So I don't know, but he could last a long time. Ultra humanite. We don't know how long he'd live. Like there's other characters out there that have this long term plan. It makes me wonder why Lex is involved necessarily, unless he's got a plan for long term. Like there, there are the whole long term thing makes perfect sense with Vandal. You know, and allows him to be a major villain throughout generations of superheroes, which is what the show is clearly going for now. <laughs> like every every year is a new generation. That's what's interesting about the light. Because if you were to sit, if I was to sit down with you and add, like and sit down a bunch of villains that don't like to work with others and are usually lone wolves and don't like to work with uh, like they'll have people work under them but not work with people it would basically be half of the light yeah which is like you know vandal he's doesn't he's not much of a team player in the in any normal universes lex luthor especially so he's always backstabbing anyone he gets involved with even when he does in the other any other universe he's in Rachel Ghoul sometimes does the team up thing, but more he 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 thinks about it in terms of like, well, maybe we'll team up forever, but I'm immortal, so this is really just me like associating with you for a little while. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of different perspectives going on in that that team. Like Black Manta is a very different type of villain with a very different types of goals than I'm sure the light have. I'm not sure what the you know mindset is with the with teaming up other than just the simple fact of strength and numbers yeah kind of like what happened well, in justice league unlimited where it's like hey there's like a hundred superheroes now and they've got stuff covered to the point where we can't even pull petty crimes anymore so we need to pull together and create a a, a legion of our own we got to create a, a legion of doom here it just to get by that's such an interesting you know viewpoint too and and Manta you know being a huge aqua family fan as I am Manta has no motivation he just hates Aquaman like generations decades this character has been around and there have been one or two attempts to make some kind of take on him uh I'm interested to see what Greg and Brandon came up with because I'm sure they sat down in the writer's room with uh, you know other writers and said look Manta's a blank slate this is great because we can use him for anything we want but what what is he doing and why is he why is he there you know and um and it wasn't him it wasn't him until second season because they had Ocean Master there who they needed for the political pull right from mm-hmm. Atlantis but um 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I agree with you with this. But I mean, so, I mean, the the plan is to, theoretically, the light's plan is to 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 bring attention to the earth. The the focus that uh, Vandal Savage has is that the humans get stronger. Basically, the more you uh, stress them out and they get these powers and they evolve forward, but they're, the Justice League is making humanity stagnant by protecting people and helping people. It's kind of parallel to to Raish, Raish, who's uh, who's an eco terrorist, and would be happy if you know six billion of the humans on the on the planet died, and then you know allowed the planet to reclaim the surface and and humans could you know evolve farther. So I see them working together. Some it's Lex and the short term goal people. Unless Raish has made a deal with him that he can use the Lazarus Pit, which makes perfect sense to me, is also really messed up. You know, there's something going on with Lex in this show that's a little more in depth in this show. Like the, I mean, there's some even there's even something with his relationship with Mercy, who's the only one he ever shows concern about in in whatsoever. And at first, I thought it was just because she was a a valued asset for another reason, like she might have been important for another goal later. But then, like that never comes up. So I'm like, oh, was that genuine concern? It's hard to get a read on Lex in this show. There's not a whole lot to gather from him other than no matter what happens it seems like he wins no matter what yeah like he's always like there's it's not a coincidence he's not at the end uh of the series at the, of that summit that he didn't make it there. oh yeah like that is <laughs> that is not a coincidence <laughs> that he did not show up he's that, playing everyone you know he is you know well he the is. reach come up like i love that the reach were the big villains of that whole season because they were you know they're playing the political game they're they're beating the 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 justice or just league what's left of the justice league and the team at every point and then near the end because of just one spy they get taken down and they realize that oh we were being played by the light the whole time like the light played us completely mm-hmm. and then even Lex Lex is like, yeah, and I'm playing a little bit on both sides too. I'm playing against the light as well as the reach. So they the reach are very much not in power at that summit, no matter how strong Black Beetle is, right? Or how much he wants to throw his weight around. They are they are the the lesser threat there. Yeah, absolutely. And and yeah, like the the light, they they have their own goals, which are not even that. Uh, well defined at the end there too because at first it was like well we teamed up the reach and i'm like that doesn't make a lot of sense and then like yeah we were only using them to get galactic uh know-how to our planet and then now we're going to use the war world to like hey you back off uh, get off my lawn or we'll uh sick the war world on you and i'm i'm very confused i'm like what is their what is their main motivation they want uh, they want everyone to know about Earth, but then they don't want anyone to come here. Like, they, do they want to know that everyone should be afraid of Earth and Earthlings? I think. Like, I think that I think Vandal is playing the long game. I think he has the war world. I think by telling everyone like, "Get off our lawn," or "Or we have the war world and we'll we'll destroy you," is going to make a huge number of despots be like, "Excuse me," and then show up. You don't tell me what to do. Yeah, they're going to show <laughs> up. They're going to show up, and it, particularly when it's released to the you know galactic public that humans have this uh, this genetic ability to adapt themselves to stressful environments and develop superpowers. Yeah, it's gonna yeah it's gonna be a thing. Like so, I I don't think he did it to be like okay now I'm gonna protect the Earth. No, he did it so that he could he could be uh, uh you know whatever using the world world to you know mad dog the galaxy into coming over to the to earth and stressing out human beings and yeah i think that's what i like about young justice is that unlike it's it's very unique in its uh, approach to how the world deals with superheroes in a super team mm-hmm. because like the governments and stuff by the end of season 2 like they're they're pretty much cool with the league by the end of it but there's definitely some tension, and even in the beginning season, it's like, yeah, the United Nations won't sanction some of their missions, so they kind of have to go behind their back. And it's it's a it's established uh, from the start, like that there's this kind of give and take relationship, which is a lot of other series, like you know, BVS, Civil War, Civil War has like a whole movie about just the fact of what do we do about a super team that has no 
oversight yeah like, do we put oversight on them do we like, in civil war the comic is all about like re- do we register anyone that has powers do we register anyone that's different or could be a threat like uh and i like that it's a little bit it's it's because i'm i'm always one in the civil war comics i was like eh, don't register everyone that's 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 running a line like that's too far especially when someone's just gonna hack the system it's like oh it's gonna be now someone's gonna hack it and figure out everyone's secret identities and everyone's gonna be screwed and the you know so i like the young justice is a very happy medium that i feel would that would come around naturally after a couple years of dealing with super people like that that's probably the state that most of these things end up on yeah i mean heck heck even tony Stark, like even in the civil war it's like civil cap tells him like hey you can sign that document tony but what happens when they tell you to go somewhere that you don't want to go or they tell you you can't go somewhere you want to go right are you gonna listen to them and even at the end of the end, the end of the uh movie tony like puts the what's his face a uh, uh general talbot on hold and like pretends to drop the call because he doesn't want to deal with them or whatever yep. i'm like you see you're ar- you're already doing it right. you're already <laughs> you know pushing back against this system that you wanted to sign up with because you thought that was the the right and proper thing to do so i like this moral don't i mean don't get me wrong i like the moral you know uh uh question of like what should what would superheroes be like in real life and what how would we approach them uh what like what like what's the real world consequences of having a uh on to- autonomous super team that can just go to whatever country they want and do stuff but i i like the fact that young justice takes it to a point where this it feels like this has been happening for a while and we got a handle on it like it it has its ups and downs and its bumps in the road but most for the most part people people like the league people uh and we the nations of the world recognize that okay we live in a we live in a world that gets rained on by asteroids and like star giant starfish try and mind control people (laughs) Uh, and you know, Neanderthals that have lived for a thousand years sometimes, you know, create doomsday devices. So we basically need a super team. Like there it's there's no two ways about it. We we need a super team around to handle these, you know, big threats. But, you know, we in in the meantime, in between those threats, like how do we deal with them? Yeah. It's it's a it's a very interesting prospect that I feel like a lot of shows to kind of gloss over of just like yeah you know superheroes they're they're fine they're everyone's cool with superheroes and you know i mean i if superheroes existed in real life it probably would be like one of the more depressing superhero comics like watchmen or maybe say the the, authority (laughs) the authority yeah like it's it would be more like those guys and if those guys i'm like yeah okay register those guys (laughs) i want to know what i want to know who they are and what they're doing like it's those guys are not cool right but you think you think about it like if Superman, like, you know, another thing that, you know, super superheroes never seem to do is like, oh, I don't get involved in politics. And I'm like, eh, I mean, you should like, I mean, wouldn't you be able to save or influence the world and change the world if you were to get involved in politics? Like, I don't mean like be a politician or anything, but what like, would you not vote for, like, say, a senator if uh, Superman uh, endorsed them? Like if yeah. Superman showed up at a rally rally for them, how would that guy not get elected to whatever right. position he was he was in? Well, that's a that's a thing that they're even in the first three episodes that they've aired so far of the Black Lightning show. Like that's that's a question that comes up where he's like, "How many more people can I save not being a superhero? Like how many more people can I save doing this other thing I'm really good at, which is which is taking care of students." Like on on a on a broader scale and and doing a basically the long game of changing a neighborhood as much as possible, right? And then he gets pushed because of the amount of violence to to revisit that decision he's made. But it's something that gets addressed in the show, you know. Another with a DC character as well, you know. What what do you do? Like, would Superman do more good making policy? You know, that's a question. The constant question of like, you know, Batman's billions would obviously be better put into, you know funding work programs in Gotham and getting like right. to and providing higher wage jobs to you know cuz to lower crime rates in Gotham yep. uh like th- that would be way more effective than going out at night and beating up thugs like it would be right. exponentially more effective but that's not a sexy story to tell right. you know right. it's not as exciting right and if you're a writer or creator of something like this for yourself 
thinking about that and finding a way or a reason for why he can't do that or what he's doing is working, but not quite enough or something like that. So, and you don't need to address it necessarily in every story, but, but having stories in which that's mentioned and you have it be that way feels like to the reader, a more grounded space, uh, a more real quote unquote space um, that you can put your, you know, completely unreal, you know, amazing superhero stories in. Well, well. In wrapping this up, is, is there anything else that you wanted to uh, that you wanted to mention or talk about? We we covered a lot of stuff from superhero movies, TV shows, comics, all across the board, and the use of kind of political intrigue to 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 turn the tension up to eleven in what's ostensibly an action based show. Oh sure, I I would be remiss if to get involved in a political discussion without mentioning uh, 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 G. Gordon Godfrey. Oh, uh, yeah, and. It's like, oh, so the Fox News does exist in right. the DC universe. That's neat. Because he's he's so the uh, the conservative shock talk show host yep. where he's, you know, like it reminds me like, oh, you know what? If super people did exist in our world, it 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 would, you know, there would be a whole right like a right wing media like slandering them like, oh, you know, he does this. But like, you know, him and his liberal stance on crime, he, if you would have if you would have just, you know, take care of these guys, you put a little more stank on them like the car, like who cares if they get hurt? Like it would be. <laughs> and of course, the whole uh, when in season two with the whole aliens coming from nowhere, like where did they even come from? Where are they? Like, <laughs> what are they doing? Like, I, yeah. It, and, and it back now in this recent election cycle again, it's like, oh boy, that doesn't that's that's reminding me of really bad things right now. Right, and what's interesting is people. A lot, there were definitely a lot of people who were when it was coming out were making comments about, oh, this is you know like a modern political you know statement that's being made. Well, no, this character was created in the seventies by Jack Kirby, who was created him to put a focus on similar people who were doing the same thing in the 70s there was a very specific uh basically radio shock jock he was uh he was imitating with g gordon and i don't remember the name of the guy um but it was someone he did not care for and uh basically made him a supervillain. <laughs> it just so happens that the <laughs> same thing is happening today or has happened and and we're seeing a lot of that it's this extremity it's this gosh darn illegal uh, intergalactic immigration, Rich. It's what's really right. messing up Earth. Make Earth great again. Right. And we got to know who they are. They're, they, I mean, they're sending us the worst. They're sending us the Croatalians, the thieves, and, you know, the Reach. And, like, they're just, you know, just thieves and murderers. Yeah. And, like, and I, I assume some are good aliens. I assume some are good aliens. Yeah. Well, I hear you. I hear you. And G. Gordon, I you know, unfortunately, we're not going to get Tim Curry voicing him again, unfortunately, which makes me sad. Uh, but we will, I, I, we're going to have G Gordon more because he's an alien. <laughs> he's an apocalyptic. <laughs> so we'll see. And he hasn't been outed yet. So we'll see, uh, we'll see if he has any more influence or if he ends up getting outed as someone who is trying to create some more, uh, uh, despondency in the world for earth as things go on. God, he was such, he was handled so well, such a great character. All right. Well, anyway, thanks so much for spending some time with us in the Watchtower, Nick. Where can people find you if they want to go listen to you uh, geek out unapologetically? They can find me at uh, our own podcast, Unapologetic Geek Out Podcast at unapologeticgeekout.com. Or if that's too much to remember, you can just look for us on UGO Podcast on iTunes. We are all of our back catalog of you know shows there, our con episodes, our TV shows, reviews, animation, that sort of thing. We just did a big review on... Uh, uh, My Hero Academia, if you're looking for more some more superheroes talk and stuff, we did a Arrowverse review of all the CW shows and their mid-season finales uh, a while back before Christmas, if that's your jam. Uh, also, our show Netflix and Kill is still up and running, where we get a guest every week and talk about whatever's on we can find on Netflix, some killer movies there. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much where you can find us nice uh and we become a fellow unapologist <laughs> and, and and find us there <laughs> awesome and thanks to everyone else for sharing some time with us as well you can find us on twitter at the yj files on facebook at crashing the mode on tumblr at the yj and on our website www.crashingthemode.com you can also find us at our email address whelmedpodcast at gmail.com 
If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings really do help others find the show. If you leave us a review, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S., uh, we have to look a little harder to find those. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology to hopefully get us more stories even sooner and get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.